in a market where cruise lines are focusing on building ships that are literally huge, Viking went a totally different way. They went small, sleek, and versatile to go places that no major cruise line has ever gone to before. Ever since the announcement of a cruise ship on the Great Lakes, I've been so excited because, frankly, I've always been jealous of people who lived in Miami or Fort Lauderdale because they always get to see cruise ships in their backyard, something that I had never experienced living in Toronto. Until now. Welcome aboard, Viking Octantis. Let me just point out that this is an expedition ship, not a cruise ship. She's designed to analyze the places that she visits and features a unique set of equipment, including two yellow submarines, fittingly named John and Paul. She's got a chief scientist in addition to an entire expedition team that really gets you involved with where you're going. On this voyage, we're heading from Milwaukee to Thunder Bay, starting off with our first port in Mackinac Island, Michigan, and then to Perry Sound, Killarney, Fraser Bay, the Sioux Locks, Silver Islet, and then an overnight in Thunder Bay. Now, I had actually ended up missing the whole welcome dinner they had scheduled for us on the evening before. That's just due to my flight being canceled because of the terrible travel situation happening at Pearson Airport. But I'm glad that I made it in time for the ship to sail. What was different on this ship is that our departure also coincided with a mandatory briefing that took place in the aula, the ship's theater, which is on the aft end of the ship. Now this was about the different equipment that we had on board and what we needed to know. There were a lot of briefings and in fact right after this we had a kayak briefing as well as a submarine briefing, so I did miss most of the sail away from Milwaukee. That evening I ended up making friends, which always helps make the cruise more exciting. We ended up going to one of the ship's main restaurants, Manfredi's, which was Italian themed. Now they had great veggie and fish options, since I only eat fish, and I had this great tuna dish as well as eggplant parmesan. But nothing could beat these sunset views as we sailed through Lake Michigan. After dinner, we quickly found what was to become my favorite place on board, the Hyde. Think of this as a speakeasy, kind of the ship's basement. It's an unconventional spot, and it's also the only venue located on deck one. It features these gorgeous windows that peek down on the port and starboard sides, and they're actually angled down. They offer stunning views, especially when the ship is in the polar regions. Then it was time for my first night on board as we sailed toward our first port of call, Mackinac Island, Michigan. The following morning, we were still sailing, due to arrive into Mackinac Island around 11 o'clock a.m. Now, I was up around 9 a.m. since I had to attend a submarine briefing in the aula, the end of which involved asking guests if they were able to swing into the submarine or not. Also, fun fact, they went over what to do if the submarine pilot became unconscious, which was basically to sit and wait, because if the submarine didn't receive any pilot commands for 10 minutes, it would automatically return to the surface. The timing of the briefing also caused me to miss seeing a sail under the Mackinac Bridge. That was followed by a workout and a legendary massage from the Nordic Spa. I just had the most amazing massage ever from the Nordic Spa here on Viking Octanus. We're in Mackinac Island. I am just making my way downstairs so I can find where they are. There they are. And uh, yeah, time to go explore this island. Fun fact about it, there are no cars on the island except for two, the fire truck as well as the ambulance. Everybody else gets around by bicycle and you can get a speeding ticket if you're going over 20 miles an hour because the police are also on bicycles. Getting off the ship in this port required a tender, which was always a smooth experience seeing as there were only 400 guests on board to begin with. Now Viking includes one shore excursion per day, so I opted for a walking tour of the island. I was so impressed with the use of bicycles because check out this guy, he was literally using his bike as a minivan. Viking tries to give every single one of their guests a listening device, known as a quiet box. In fact, they include them in your cabin and they're always charged. Now, I didn't actually realize I needed mine, and luckily they always had extras. 
Now, if you ever get to Mackinac Island, be sure to try and check out the Grand Hotel because it is a spectacle. The interesting thing was that as I was about to leave on the tour, I was actually stopped by the ship's kayak guide, who told me that I had missed the kayak test, meaning I couldn't go on any kayak excursions until I had completed the test. The ironic thing was that I had missed the kayak test because I was attending the submarine briefing. Now, as I walked through the island, I was amazed at their use of bicycles and just how beautiful and quaint this place is. When I got back on board, I was excited to see this massive piece of fudge on my bed, something that Mackinac Island was known for, and it was a present courtesy of Viking that every single guest received. A really nice touch. That night, I had dinner in the ship's main restaurant, aptly named The Restaurant, where the menu changed every single night. After hitting the hide for a nightcap, I called it an early night because the following day was a big one. I'd be heading out on a Zodiac and on a tour of the ship's bridge. Perry Sound is located in Georgian Bay, and it's only about two and a half hours from Toronto. My day began with a workout, and it was just nice to see water bottles readily available at the gym. About to head out on one of the Zodiacs that are actually used for expeditions, and uh, the way to get there is going to be relatively easy, I have to remember, but we're going out here in Perry Sound. We're back in Canada today. Here I am going back to my cabin because I wasn't told I needed to bring my own life jacket that's in my cabin down to the embarkation area, so I gotta go back and get it. Soon enough, I was on a Zodiac, and the ship actually comes with a whole fleet of Zodiacs operated by the expeditions team. The way it works is that in the morning when the ship arrives, the expedition leader will sail around scouting good spots to sail through that also comply with local regulations. I feel like this resulted in feeling like you're actually on an expedition. It was raw in a way. I felt like I was seeing my country in a whole different way and I was so proud of it. Soon enough, it was time to make my way back on board because now I was heading up to see the ship's bridge and to meet the captain. Now the bridge is also the central command center of the ship and it's where the ship's officers maneuver and steer the vessel. It's got all the bells and whistles of any modern ship, including a safety center as well as azipods, which make the ship incredibly maneuverable. Interestingly, the ship's bridge doesn't have overhangs on the sides like a conventional cruise ship, and this is because they need to keep the width consistent in order to make the ship fit through the various locks located in the Great Lakes. It's also what gives Viking Octantis such versatility in the ports she visits. By this point, it was lunchtime, so I headed to the Explorer's Lounge, which incredibly spans two full decks on this ship. It's a staple of Vikings ocean ships as well, and it's amazing that they fit it into this ship so beautifully. And then it was lunchtime at the World Cafe, and this is truly the best buffet-style restaurant I've ever eaten at. My favorite is the sushi bar, which never failed to impress. Now, since I'd already done the day's activities, I decided it was five o'clock somewhere, and I tried out the Aquavit Terrace, where there's three pools, warm, medium, and just cold, very cold. The medium one stretches into the inside, with the three of them all on the outside portion of the deck. Then I headed to the Nordic Spa, which is something I really wanted to highlight. Everything in the spa is there for you to use, no membership or anything needed. You just walk in, grab a robe, and enjoy. The experience shower has a series of jets, and it really was an experience. I enjoyed it. The bucket shower is essentially a bucket that dunks cold water on you. And then there is the snow grotto. So I'm currently inside the snow grotto here on Viking Octanus. Uh, this is freaking cold. It's legitimately snowing right now, and that is 
very, 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 very cold. I'm leaving. And then there's the Badistamp, which is essentially a semi-outdoor hot tub, and Viking just did an amazing job with making this outdoor, but also protected. <laughs> Out of all the ships I've been on, this spa facility is amazing. Top off with being able to sit in an outdoor hot tub so close to the water, it's kind of epic. By the time I was done, I needed dessert, which is where I found the Cold Stone in the World Cafe. The chef breaks down a fruit, like berries or a banana, mixes it with some ice cream, and the result is a fantastic, relatively healthy dessert. Dinner was back at Manfredi's and a nice brandy to finish off the night before going into one of the most exciting days yet, the day I got to ride the submarine and the special operations boat. The morning of Killarney, I woke up a little bit later than I would have wanted and it turned out that I missed breakfast by just a few minutes. As soon as I sat down at my table, a waiter came by and asked if there was anything they could get me. So I told them I was sad that I missed getting my regular omelette. A moment later, they came out with an omelette that had all of my favorite toppings. I was just blown away. And then it was time for adventure. Today we're in Killarney, part of the Georgian Bay, and I am wearing my life jacket because I'm about to go on the special operations boat, which belongs to Viking Octanus. We're gonna be launched from near the hangar at the back of the ship and hopefully get some really high speeds and go exploring. I made my way down to the hangar, which is where most of the expedition equipment is stored. The special operations boats are the exact same models that are used by the Norwegian Special Forces, capable of reaching speeds of over 60 knots or 100 kilometers an hour. You board the special operations boats, or as they call them on board Octanus, the SOBs, from right within the hangar, and the boats are actually loaded off by a hydraulic launch system directly from the hangar into the water. Once we were out, we headed for some gorgeous sightseeing, catching some rare birds and overall just beautiful scenery. Each individual seat on the SOBs have their own independent suspension, so the ride itself is incredibly smooth despite there being a lot of movement, especially at higher speeds. Soon enough, we arrived back into the hangar and I headed straight to the submarine meeting point for my adventure. It's an exciting day because on top of the SOB, I get to go into a submarine. Just got my boots on, I've got my, my seat number ready to go, so it's going to the surface. Every single guest that wants to travel on a submarine needs to be weighed beforehand. Then you're assigned a seat number for a specific day on a specific trip. It's actually so strict that if someone doesn't show up, they need to add the equivalent weight of that individual to ensure that the submarine is properly balanced. On this day, the water was quite choppy, which made boarding the submarine a bit of a challenge. In fact, a lot of submarine trips were canceled due to weather, but it was understandable given the safety aspect of it all. Once inside, it was pretty choppy and there was a lot of movement, but this was just for the boarding process. Once we actually dove down, everything was pretty calm. Now, I would suggest taking a gravel or a Dramamine beforehand. The interior of the submarine overall is tight, but comfortable. The bubbles on either side of the sub are actually made of thick plastic as opposed to glass, which allows it to be flexible. It's important given the change in pressure because these submarines are rated to reach depths well over 300 feet. Diving below the surface of the Great Lakes? Talk about once in a lifetime. They also operate these submarine expeditions in Antarctica. They're constantly helping the local areas that they sail to by mapping these somewhat remote areas, most of which haven't ever been visited by submarines. And this was by far the coolest thing 
I have ever done on a ship. That evening, I was invited to a really nice exclusive dinner with the ship's general manager, and after, I ended up on the Finsa Terrace, just outside of the Aula. It's a really underutilized space and actually has outdoor heating, and the sunset rewarded us for being out there on this particular night. The following morning was the earliest that I had woken up because it was also the morning of our weather balloon launch. Fraser Bay is located very close to Killarney. In fact, we had arrived just two hours after setting sail the previous evening. The weather balloon launch was conducted by the onboard science team led by chief scientist Dr. Daniel Moore. The science team inflates the balloon with helium and deploys it from deck 7. The GPS tracker is biodegradable, and as the balloon climbs, the wire unwinds and drops lower and lower beneath the balloon so that the balloon itself doesn't interfere with the data that's being collected. Now, after the balloon launches, you can actually see the data live in real time from Expedition Central, and it's also sent to the National Weather Service. Now, this balloon was the highest ever recorded from Viking Octanus, reaching over 30 kilometers or almost 100,000 feet into the atmosphere. Quite a few guests came out to see this. It's actually very unique because Viking Octantis is one of very few ships that's designated as an official weather balloon launch station by the National Weather Service. Now, since this ship visits relatively remote areas, it's allowing for data to be collected that otherwise wouldn't be. Since I was already up, I decided it was time for breakfast. I headed back to my cabin after that, and the type of room that I had was a Nordic penthouse. Now, this is a couple of categories higher than a regular balcony, featuring a slightly larger sitting area, and overall, the room was slightly wider than a regular balcony as well. I love this cabin, especially the Nordic balcony, a window that opens up. It was remarkable. The details in this room were impeccable, including fabric on the walls and heated floors in the bathroom, a feature that you don't know you need until you've had it plus built-in USB ports and built-in wireless charging to the nightstands. Now, something I thought that was hilarious was the included price list of various items that were in the cabin, so should you decide to take anything, you know exactly how much you're going to be charged. I'll be posting a separate video with an in-depth cabin tour, so be sure to watch out for that. Having been to Fraser Bay before, I decided to stay on board and enjoy the spa as well as getting some laundry done. Right across from my room was a laundrette, super easy to use. So you basically select your corresponding washing machine, then the detergent is automatically deposited. All of this is included, of course, and I love it because it means you don't have to go home with any dirty clothes, no laundry when you get back. Since I had the time, I ventured down to the hangar to get up close and personal with the ship's expedition equipment. This is where the cruise experience meets the expedition experience. You've got these incredible vessels capable of going over 40 knots mixed in with the science lab that's clearly visible here as the scientists are working hard. So it's mixing that luxury experience with some pretty exclusive ways to travel and see very remote places. While I was down there, you can see here some of the submarines preparing to dive. Now this is a submarine actually that I was on, John, complete with a robotic arm and everything. When Viking Octanus' sister ship, Polaris, comes out later this year, she's going to have two submarines aboard her as well, fittingly named George and Ringo. These are the massive hoists that transfer the submarines into the water. Right below the ship's science lab is the microplastics system. It's constantly analyzing the water and sending the data back to NEVA, the Norwegian Institute for Water Research. You've got a great view of the science lab here from the hangar, and I've actually got more on the science lab and what the science team is doing coming up here in just a couple of minutes, so make sure to stay tuned. Then I headed up to the World Cafe for a bit of an early dinner, seared ahi tuna, impeccable, and then made my way down to Manfredi's for my actual dinner for a great bowl of gnocchi. The following morning was, in my opinion, the most scenic sailing I've ever done outside of the Baltic Sea. It reminded me of the entry into Stockholm, Sweden. We were approaching the Sulaks, which we needed to pass through in order to enter Lake Superior for our final two ports, Silver Islet and Thunder Bay. Everyone was out on the ship's forward decks to watch the ship transition. 
Viking Octanus is the largest passenger vessel to ever pass through these locks. Apparently, the Sioux locks are known as the linchpin of the Great Lakes, and they have history dating back to the 1800s. About 7,000 ships pass through these locks every single year, and they're raised and lowered by about 21 feet, which is the difference between Lake Superior and Lake Huron. There are four locks in total, of which two are operational. The one we were in was the Poe Lock, and it was rebuilt in 1968. Then the MacArthur Lock was constructed in 1943. There are also two other locks, Davis and Sabin Locks, which have been inactive since 1989. This was a full day out on the lake after we transitioned through the locks. Now, despite every single guest and crew member being on board the ship, it never felt busy at any point. A great place for a snack that I discovered was called Mamsen's, just off of the World Cafe. It's a small self-service restaurant with feel-good Norwegian waffles and snacks, also a great spot for afternoon tea. That evening in the restaurant, I'd managed to become friends with the head chef and had some awesome dosa. After that, we headed out to see the ship's entertainment manager, Aran, perform in the outla. I decided to head to the hide and call it a relatively early night because for our final day on board, we were visiting two ports and getting a tour of the microplastics lab. The following morning, we were anchored in Silver Islet, Ontario. Now, Viking includes one shore excursion per port, and our walking tour gave us some awesome information about this little community. Silver Islet refers to both a small rocky island and a small community located in northwestern Ontario, near Thunder Bay. Silver was discovered on this small island in 1868 by the Montreal Mining Company, and then it became a small mining community. Many of the residents actually still have a connection to the mining origins of Silver Islet. As I got back on board, I headed straight down to the science lab for something I had been waiting for since I boarded Viking Octantis, a tour of the science lab with Dr. Daniel Moore, the ship's chief scientist, to showcase exactly what this ship was all about. Most science labs run into issues of funding, and that's something that this lab doesn't have a lack of since revenue is generated through the ship's operation itself. It's a concept that a few companies are looking at. But to answer why the lab is there in the first place, let's try and understand what microplastics actually are. As larger plastic pieces are exposed to UV light, it causes smaller plastic to be broken up and then get eaten by the smallest things in the ocean. Plastic breaks up as opposed to down. One of the many things the onboard science team does is to constantly analyze the waters in which they sail. It's also how they get guests involved in the process. Dr. Moore walked us through what it's like to try and identify microplastics. First, it needs to be continuous in length and opaque throughout. Second, it needs to be a continuous strip. Color-wise, it needs to be relatively unnatural. For example, blue is rare in nature, which increases the chance that it's a microplastic. Also, if it's a dark, deep red or black, there's a higher chance that it's a microplastic. Then, they walk through how to set up a microscope and start analyzing. From there, the samples that are flagged by guests get analyzed by a Fournier Transformed Infrared Spectrometer. Try saying that five times fast. After my tour, we had already set sail, and this time, for the final time, arriving in Thunder Bay a few short hours later. The ship would be overnighting here for our final night on board. Viking Octantis is the most interesting ship I have ever sailed upon. Her sleek design makes her beautiful inside and out, and her purpose isn't just to go from one place to another. It's to create a positive impact and offer something to every single port that she visits. It's inspiring to see a major cruise line like Viking integrate sustainability, science, and a top-notch experience so seamlessly. Viking is a very enrichment-heavy cruise line, and Octantis complements that very well. Thank you so much to Viking for having me aboard your truly remarkable ship. The crew were so amazing and made the whole trip on this iconic vessel so special. And just like that, my time here on Viking Octantis is complete. And what an amazing voyage it was. I can't wait to sail aboard her sister, Viking Polaris, or of course, aboard Octantis again very, very soon. 
Would you sail the Great Lakes? Tell me what you think in the comments below, and of course, be sure to subscribe. Thanks so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one.